Cottonborn edits the news. Good evening, everybody. In the war at sea today, Britain reports that three German submarines have been destroyed in the course of a single day. That indicates the continued effectiveness of the British methods of attack. It also indicates that in view of the sinking of three of these submarines, in one day that Britain has decided to change her usual policy of not making any specific announcements with reference to what she accomplishes with regard to submarines. She has felt thus far that by not saying anything about what she succeeds in doing with regard to the submarine menace and simply let submarines disappear and the Germans wonder what became of them, that she will more effectively undermine the morale of the German crews than by making definite announcements as to sinkings. Now, today, she changes that policy for the natural reason that three have been sunk in one day and that that is such an outstanding success that it is worth announcing. For the first time since October 4th also, the German submarines have sunk a British flare freighter. Now, sinking of warships and merchant vessels can never be entirely eliminated. They are inevitable casualties of sea warfare. It is just a question of what the subware, submarine warfare costs Germany and how much it can accomplish as compared to submarine losses. And the balance so far seems to have been very distinctly in favor of the defensive against submarines. For it is evident that something like 15 have been disposed of on the basis of the official announcements from France and Britain, and also that there has been a steady decrease in the sinking of merchant ships by submarines. However, it's too early in the war to come to any final conclusion. All we can say is that thus far, the defensive has it with respect to submarine warfare. Now, as to the war in the West, there's the usual talk today once more of a major offensive. Remember that we've had that talk now for weeks. Every time there are troop movements on one side or the other, there's talk about a major offensive. Now, as a rule, that talk comes when Germans move troops, because it is generally expected that they are the ones who are going to conduct this first major offensive in the West. However, we must always take any announcement of a major offensive in the West with a great deal of reserve. We must remember that intense aerial activity and intense artillery fire are going to be the forerunners of any offensive, and neither is reported today. There's been foggy, rainy weather on the Western Front, and that kind of weather is likely to be frequent, and unless the offensive should come within a very few weeks, it most likely will not come at all until spring. That is, unless there is such a desperate situation in Germany that they must, under all circumstances, launch an offensive, because an offensive against either the Maginot Line or the Siegfried Line is the counsel of desperation rather than the logical attitude of the army. Remember the strength of those two lines. Remember how long they have now been developed. Remember the cost to whatever army undertakes that offensive. The British are constantly increasing the strength of their army on the Western Front. There are reports today from various American correspondents who have been there with the British Army. They indicate that these British forces are better trained and far better equipped than those that came over in the World War, that the British are not going to send more than they can properly supply this time. A statement has been made that there are already 25,000 British motor vehicles in France, and that's important. Webb Miller, the United Press correspondent, estimated today, on the basis of his observation on the Western Front with the British contingent, that they have from 10 to 15 times as many motor vehicles per division as they had in the World War. And that indicates the extent to which this war has been mechanized. United States Senator Nye told the Senate today, quote, you cannot build sound prosperity upon the sands of wholesale murder, end quote. That's one of those eloquent phrases that stir emotion, but that don't tell us much about what the Neutrality Act will really do if it is amended or if it is not amended. He insisted that the trade in munitions was responsible for our involvement in the world war. He contradicted Senator Taft of Ohio, who contends that repealing the embargo will help us to avoid the war. And there was a sharp passage at arms between Senator Nye and Senator Norris with respect to this involvement in war if we change the Neutrality Act. 
Senator Norris became quite indignant when Senator Nye charged that to change the Neutrality Act to eliminate the embargo would involve us in war. Senator Nye has constantly insisted that the sale of munitions got us into the world war. You must remember he was chairman of the committee that made that munitions investigation. His mind was constantly on that. He developed the report, and it's quite natural that he has a prejudice in that direction. Of course, what might be pointed out, I haven't seen any senator pointed out yet, is that only 15% of all that we sold the Allies during the World War could be classed as munitions. 85% of everything we sold would not have been affected by this munitions embargo at all. But Senator Nye is the only isolationist senator who said yes in response to my question as to whether he would accept a complete embargo on food, raw materials, and manufactured goods as well as on munitions. He is at least consistent in his attitude. He suggested today that we ought to consult our 40 leading industrialists and 10 cabinet members on the probable effect of a war boom on our economy. He maintains that the cash and carry plan will allow a war boom, and a war boom would be a bad thing. But to make his inquiry completely fair, Senator Nye ought to ask the industrialists and the cabinet members what would happen if we embargoed everything that might be called contraband of war. Most experts declare that this would bring a calamitous depression to the United States. The thing that has struck me during a two weeks trip through the Middle West, which I have just concluded, is that the business pickup until now seems to be based on genuine recovery rather than on any war boom. Retail trade, wholesale trade, and manufacturing in the most diverse lines has shown marked improvement everywhere. Hotels and taxi drivers are unanimous in reporting better business. Several businessmen with whom I talked said that the most interesting feature of the present business pickup is that businessmen refuse to get excited about it. Quite a number are turning down orders in preference to expanding their plants. They would rather lose business now than face a sudden collapse later. There is a conservative attitude towards new business that contrasts sharply with what happened in former periods of expansion. Senator Nye protested today against, quote, regaining our prosperity by tying it to the coattails of the most uncertain thing and the most uncertain time element in the world, European war, end quote. A good many businessmen seem to realize the danger of a war boom and are guarding against it. Whether they will succeed remains to be seen. The German press bureau has issued a statement calling the Chamberlain speech an unheard of insult to Germany. During his interview with the foreign press correspondents today, Dr. Dietrich, the German press chief, said that the United States was certainly qualified to intervene as a mediator in the European war. This was construed as an appeal for American intervention and was so featured in some newspapers. Now tonight, the official German news agency took the trouble to say that no appeal to President Roosevelt to intervene was made or intended. Now, I don't know whether they had President Roosevelt's reaction to the Dietrich suggestion before they issued this corrective statement. Because, of course, Dr. Dietrich's remark was featured. After all, he had talked with Hitler, and he was supposed to be speaking for the German government. Now, the White House has constantly emphasized that it has received no peace proposal from anyone and no request for intervention from anyone. Yet, there have been several hints from Germany suggesting intervention by this country. We must remember that the Germans want peace, and they want it badly, but they do not want to ask for it. Hitler said in his Reichstag speech, in effect, we have achieved our war aims. Now give us peace, or you will be responsible for what happens. France and England have said that this is not a peace appeal. So if President Roosevelt should take this Reichstag speech as a basis for intervention, he might please the Germans, but he would displease France and England. On the basis of the most recent public polls, some 83% of all Americans favor the Allies as against the Germans. Now, obviously, no democratic government is likely to do something that might be resented by many Americans who agree with the French and British about the real character of Hitler's speech. The thing that impressed me the last time I was in Washington is the care that is being taken by the administration to move with the utmost caution in matters connected with the war. There is a great effort to keep in close touch with the development of public opinion here and not to get ahead of it.
the President's appeal to Russia on behalf of Finland is a case in point. It is made not by the United States government to the government of Russia. It's a personal appeal by Franklin D. Roosevelt to President Kalinin, which gives it quite a different character. Now, Finland tonight is in a very delicate position, as her foreign minister said. The Nordic nations are meeting at Stockholm on October 18th. And, of course, that's a gesture in an attempt to help Finland. And yet, Paris reports tonight that Sweden, Norway and Denmark have told Finland that if war comes, they, unfortunately, will not be in a position to join that war. And Finland still hopes, says there is reason to continue the Moscow negotiations in the hope that the Soviet government will be reasonable. The world shares that hope. Good night.